Click the bell icon to get latest videos from Ikeda. Hello friends, today we will talk about multiple granularity that is a protocol to handle the situation of crops in a granularity level. We will talk about that how we can achieve this multiple granularity implemented as a protocol to achieve the concurrency control in our transaction management system. Such a situation in concurrency control system occurs often when we are having, say for some transaction, it needs to access the entire database and sometimes the transaction is in a lower level of operation that it needs to perform in a particular record on that database. Now suppose we have TI transactions which needs a single log for the entire database. Say that the TI needs, there are relation R1, R2, R3, Rn, and now it needs a relational log on this R1, R2, Rn, and all. So what it needs to do within this two-phase locking protocol and also this timestamp-based protocol, validation-based protocol, it first need to log the data on every records individually. Say for it, it was needs to lock TI on lock R1, like this lock R2, now till lock Rn. So what we are having, we are having an extra overhead of this locking information that we need to store about the record that a transaction is locking. Now rather, if it had a lock on a single, that is a database lock, so now we are having this database log to acquire the transaction, every record, every file to the database to access with. Now what happens if there is another transaction TJ which requires a particular record, say R3 on that database. So it needs to lock an R3. So if the transaction system provides a database lock, not this one, this is impossible for us the transactions to lock an entire database where it needs a small, small, small portion of this. And also if it provides this locking mechanism but not this database lock, then there will be an extra overhead of keeping the lock information of every record with the same transaction which it needs to access. Now what happens and what we can do with this concurrency control? we can provide a level of granularity that is attached to every transaction. That means we are providing multiple granularity on this course of concurrency control. So there are coarser level of granularity, also final level of granularity. So now we can achieve different parts on the database that we can provide and lock. Now let us define a tree protocol that we have described in our previous videos that how to perform this tree protocol inside a transaction management system. Now we will use that tree protocol with the root node and the non-leaf nodes and also the leaf nodes that is not in root node inside this protocol to achieve this multiple granularity problem. Now let us first define a database DB. So our database is containing DB which is having three areas. So the database is the coarser level of this granularity that is in whole database. Now we are dividing the database into areas where we are defined it as area one, two, and three. So database is a set of area one, two, three. Now each of these areas can have files with these areas. Now we are composing areas with the similar files or the similar types of data that is recorded in the file. So now each of these files will have and composed of an area. So now my A1 is having one file that is F1. A2 is having two files. And finally A3 is having F4. So here we can see that the next coarser level is the area and finally is the file. Now inside the file we have the atomic information that we can store it as a record of some entity. So tuple and the record as the atomic entity or what we can have as an information to the whole of this file. So now each of this file could have been consistent 
the records in it. So see there are three records in this file, one, two records in the file two, and two records in the file three. So here we can see that record as the finest level of granularity that we can provide to our tree protocol to achieve the multiple granularity. Now, there is two types of modes on the locks that we can provide. One is an explicit mode lock, another is an implicit mode of lock. Now, when is the finest level of granularity or at the lower level, we are having this explicit mode of lock. And when we have an implicit lock on the coarser level or the higher level, then we can say that the explicit lock, there is no need to share it. Otherwise, if we are having an implicit lock, say on this area, then we are having the locks on these files and records without explicitly locking it. So implicit locking is by default locking of a nature on an explicit lock on a higher granularity. So in this way, we can provide that for each transaction, which is the appropriate granular level to lock and then provide an appropriate mode on that lock. Say suppose that transaction TI has an explicit lock on this record of file F2. So we do not need to explicitly lock R21 and R22 because it will implicit lock on R21 and R22 at a result of an exclusive lock with this F2. Because the higher level of granularity implicitly locks all the final level of granulars. Now we will talk about the situation that we can arrive with other than this explicit and implicit mode of lock. Now the TI has a lock on explicitly that is F2 to it. So now TI is having this explicit lock on F2 and by implicit locking R21 and R22 is locked by TI. So TI is also have a lock on R21 and R22. Now say there is a request from TJ to lock R21. So what happens in this case we are having a request that is an explicit lock to R21. We know when we are want to access a data item, we need to explicitly lock it. So TJ has requested for R21 explicit lock. TI has locked F21. As a result, R21 and R22 is implicitly locked to it. But TI has not explicitly locked on R21. So what happens that TJ will find that R21 is not explicitly locked. And now we will thus arise in a situation or an ambiguity that whether R21 is to be reverted to TJ or not. Because R21 is not explicitly locked, but it is implicitly locked by the result of an explicit lock of F2 to TI. So this is the first condition that we can go with an ambiguous nature in the multiple granularity concept. Now suppose that TK wants an database lock on this TB. So the TK has acquired an explicit lock on database. Now that arrives an TL which wants an area 3 locking to explicit. Now as a result of this explicit lock TB, TK will have all the locks on A1, A2, A3, F1, F2, F3, F4, R11 to R32. So how can I give this TL an explicit lock to A3? It will not only give a problem to the ambiguous nature of this multiple granularity, also it will lead us in concurrency problem because at the same time, TL and TK both will have an explicit lock on this A3. Because as a result of the explicit lock on database, TK is having the lock on A3, but do not need to explicitly acquire this lock. So these two problems leads to the modification of this multiple granularity protocol. Now that TI say suppose it is having a lock on F2, now TK requires an explicitly lock on DB. So what happens that a part of the system is being locked explicitly by some transaction that we cannot just give an explicit lock to the database as its whole. Because how can we determine that the root node explicit lock will not affect the lock in this way that the secondary locks that was being given to other transaction. So the modification that we want to do is an intention mode lock. What is an intention mode lock that from the root node 
to the record. If there is such problem, then we need to search for every record, every file, every area inside the database to find out that the root node has been affecting the explicitly log or not. Now, this is not at all a desirable solution because recording and searching for every record, it defeats all the concepts of multiple granularity. Then I need to search all the records that will be an obvious extra overhead to us. So what we can do, we can instead use this intention mode lock. Now in an intention mode lock, all the explicit lock is given at the final level of granularity and at the higher level of granularity, it is only noted as an intention to lock that level. And if there is a node that is parent to that node and it is intentionally locked, then only the child of that node will be explicitly locked for that particular transaction. Other than that, it will not allow the lock to be happen. So now from this root to this record on this path, we will put an intention lock to every parent node onto which we want to perform and child not explicitly lock. Now suppose that we are having this hierarchy and now I want to lock this F11. So we need to put an intention lock on every parent node preceding this F11. So now I will traverse a whole tree to reach this F11. That first the DB, then A1, then F1. Till now we will put all the intention locks. Now the intention locks are itself are of different types. The first one is an intention shared mode. Now with an IS or intention shared mode lock, with all the intention locks that we are providing at the final level of granularity, we will have only the shared mode lock. That means intention lock will be put in this one, where in the F11 it will be given an IS or intention shared lock. Like this one, in an intention exclusive lock, we will have all the locks that is parent to the child node or the final level granularity as the intention locks and the final is an exclusive lock. So then what is the use of this intention lock? We are defining for the parent node that some lock is going to be granted on the finer granule till when we are having the intentions. That means there are intention for the locking. So now, no need to search all the traversing paths from this root to the leaf node to acquire that a lock has been granted by any transaction node. If there is any intention that we are finding on a higher level, then we will not traverse the path because there is possibility that we are having a lock at this final level granularity. So now with this IEX mode lock, we will have the exclusive lock at this final level granularity. Now there are also a mode that is shared intention exclusive lock, which we're defining as SIX. Now this shared intention exclusive mode lock give us all the shared mode intentions on this previous levels and the exclusive mode on this final level. So now we can say that is not intention lock we are providing with the higher level. We are actually having an explicit shared lock. So the explicit shared lock is being intentioned with this higher level and the last level is giving an exclusive lock inside the mechanism of XIX or shared intention exclusive mode lock. Now we need to define a compatibility matrix based on these five types of locks. The shared, exclusive, intention shared, intention exclusive, and shared intention exclusive. Now let us first build this compatibility matrix. So now this compatibility matrix will take this rift column as this supporting column and we will check that even intention shared lock is available then for these five types of locks which can be granted or not. Now, if it is an intention shared lock, then the child node can be granted with this intention shared lock. That means the next node can also be an intention shared lock. So we are providing true here. Now, also for the intention shared lock, the next one can be an intention exclusive lock or intention shared lock. Now maybe we have reached the final level of granularity. That means we have put this intention shared as the shared mode of lock at this final level. 
Now, if this one that is if it is an intention shared log, then the next node can have this intention shared exclusive log. That means we are reaching in a node that is given an explicit shared log that was previously defined as an intention shared log. So now we can allow this as an intention shared exclusive log. But if this is an intention shared log that we have made at this higher level, then we cannot have this exclusive log at this last level. Now, if it is an intention exclusive log, then the next one can be an intention exclusive log, obviously. And if it is an intention exclusive, the next one can, so can also be an intention shared or an intention exclusive log. But it is an intention exclusive log, then following by the path at the final level, we cannot have then shared log. Now, if it is an intention exclusive log, we also cannot have an shared log that is explicitly made on the next node to have the exclusive node and this explicit node. So this one is also false. And if it is also an intention exclusive log, then the next node cannot be then exclusive log. Now, if it is an shared log, then the next node can be an intention shared log. Also, it cannot be an intention exclusive log, but it is already it is an shared log. Now, it can be an shared log on this next level because it is already being a shared log. Now, this next one goes for the exclusive log, so we cannot have this with an shared mode log. Now, the definition of shared intensive exclusive lock goes for that it only can be an intensive shared lock and all other locks we cannot have from this SIX because at the end it will be an shared that is an intention locks and an exclusive lock at the last. So, the all last one will be false from this first one. Now, if it is the exclusive log that we have already acquired, then we cannot acquire any mode, any type of log, implicit, explicit on any record, file, database or area. So, this is the granularity compatibility matrix on this five types of logs. Now, we will define this protocol based on this multiple granularity. Now, first when a transaction TI is entering this protocol or in this tree protocol supporting the multiple granularity, it must satisfy the compatibility matrix function. So, the first one step is TI must satisfy the compatibility matrix function. Now, next is that TI must lock as an intention or exclusive implicit, but was the root node at its first, and then it can lock any other node. So, for the root node, if it is an intention lock, then it can lock the other nodes in an exclusive lock. So, TI first acquire, lock the root node, and then it can lock any other node. Now, if TI has requested for a lock, then it can gain an IS or IX lock on a data item Q if TJ is the parent of Q and TJ has locked the data item as if in S or this IX mode. That means if TJ is a parent of Q and has mode on this internal intention exclusive or shared lock, then only it can have the TI which is acquiring a lock on this Q as an intention shared or intention exclusive mode. Now, TI has requested for a particular lock and it can acquire the lock in S, SIX or IX on Q if TJ is the parent of Q and TJ has acquired an SIX or IX on Q. That is obviously it can acquire an exclusive mode lock even only if, if it is the shared intention locks or is the intention exclusive locks on that particular TI. So if TJ has acquired the already lock on Q and TJ is the parent of Q, then only TI can acquire this lock. Now, to support the two-phase locking protocol, TI can provide lock on any data item Q if and only if TJ has not locked it on the data item Q while T 
Ti is greater than Tj. That means Ti is younger than Tj and Ti is lock on Q and Tj has not a lock on Q. Now finally the protocol says that if Ti needs to unlock an item Q then the Ti must not acquire any locks on the children of Q. That means Ti cannot have any lock on the R that is an children of Q. So in this way if you follow this rules then we can acquire the multiple granularity protocol. Now according to the rule if we look and observe this transaction then we can redefine our tree protocol. See that when we are following this protocol we are having the locks acquired in a top down manner that is the root node first and the lift node last while in the releasing of locks in a bottom-up manner. That means we have just defined that a children will be unlocked first and then only the parent can be unlocked. There is no parent that can be unlocked with the children locked to a transaction. Now let us consider these transactions. Suppose that T1 read a data item R12 from the file F1. Then T1 request for a lock on the database. So first it is reading and later on this record on file F1 that means it needs a shared lock to achieve this one. Now you are requesting lock for this database that means a whole database access. Now it requests lock for an area A1 then file F1 in intention shared mode. That means the database will be intention shared, A1 will be intention shared and finally F1 will be shared to achieve this read. Now let us define another transaction T2. So now if it want to write any record in file 1, say for this write R11 in file F1. So first it needs to request log for database then it needs to request lock to area 1 and F1 in IX mode because exclusive mode it needs to write and data to R11. So for the modification and for the write we need an IX mode for the parent nodes to get an exclusive lock in the last or the final level nodes. Now if T3 reads the file 1 then it needs to read and request lock onto the database first and then it requests the lock in an area 1 onto this IS mode so that we can have this read on the shared mode. Now finally we have T4 which want to read the whole database. Then T4 needs to request lock the database in a shared mode. Now we can see that transactions T1, T3 and T4, this can access the database concurrently. Because T1 was reading a particular record, T3 was reading a particular file and T4 was reading a particular database. So all are read operations. So now T1, T3, T4 that access the database concurrently all have the database locked in an intention shared or shared mode. But T2 also can exclusively concurrently execute with T1 because we can say that T1 and T2 both needs an explicit lock on this record or this R11 because the R11 is the one exclusive lock on T2 and R12 is the lock exclusive on T1. On T1 it needs a shared and on T2 it needs an exclusive. So that is also possible because IS and IX are compatible to give this S and X individually. So now T2 can execute with T1 but say T2 cannot execute with T3 and T4 because T2 needs to modify a particular record in the file while T3 and T4 wants to read all the files and all the databases. So now T3 and T4 will need to read a value that has been written by this T2. 
So there will be a concurrency problem for T2 and T3 and T4 if they want to perform concurrently. So this is the basic need of this multiple granularity level or the protocol to define if we want to that T2, T3 and T4 and T1, T2, T3, T4 must perform in some order so that we can assure the concurrency between this protocol. Now we can say from this protocol there are two possible conclusions that the short transactions are performed on this records or maybe files or the long transactions can perform the whole database reads as a report or a result of the files or an area of the database so that we can acquire an exclusive lock on this final level like this file or record only, not the database and area only, because we may want to read the database but not update the database as a whole. So in this way, this multiple granularity locking protocol provides us the mechanism for the concurrency, the conflict serializability, but it is not free from the deadlock handling protocol because it is following the two-phase locking mechanism. And also we can starve for a long transaction because the short transactions are having the exclusive mode lock again and again, whether the database locks and the area locks are waiting for a long time. So this is all for the multiple granularity protocol for solving the concurrency problem in this database management system. Thank you for watching this video. Stay tuned with Ikira and subscribe to Ikira.